500 people commented on the last video I put up where I showed the wood slicing machine in action. Thanks everybody! Although almost all the comments could be sorted under four headings. So I'll quickly go through those because I just don't have time to answer everyone individually and I need you all on board for the next exciting step in the project. Number one, securing the nuts on the bearings. Yes, thanks, I do know about nylon nuts and double nuts to hold things in place. Really though, I need to use these little holes which are for positioning pins. These are what will stop any sideways twist. Thanks for the couple of people who reminded me of those. There are other ways to stop bearing blocks moving, but we'll try these first. Number two, swiveling the blade so it cuts more like a guillotine. Setting the blade up at an angle makes sense, of course. In a way, it would mean that the cut starts narrow and then expands to the full width of the log. But it would push the log sideways as well. So I expect there would be a lot more instances where the log spins around and gets stuck sideways. And it would be more difficult, maybe impossible, to put more than one log in at a time because of the same problem. Logs jumping sideways into one another. But the main reason I cannot even try that is simply because my blade isn't long enough. This is a big heavy blade and I was lucky to be given it, but to buy a longer one, new, would cost hundreds of euro I'm sure, and I wouldn't know where to get one. And I would like to try making one one day, but not just yet. In the meantime, if I used the one I have and angled it, then it would clear a shorter length of cut, obviously. So all the logs I'm slicing would need to be shorter. So that would take more time and work to achieve the same amount of wood slices. So that's not so good, especially when the way it is now works. Number three, increasing the stroke with a pivoting lever. This is about increasing the distance that the blade travels each time. There are a couple of ways to do this and lots of you suggested the pivoting lever design. The lever is pushed back and forth by the conrod from the eccentric and a second conrod is connected further away from the pivot point. Theoretically, it's very neat because you could change the distance of stroke by moving the conrod connection up or down. The lever itself would need to be seriously strong though to withstand the stresses put on it. Big bearings at the bottom too. And then there's the two conrod connections. Hmm. And if it was mounted on the ground, then to double the stroke, the second connection would need to be way up in the air, which would mean lots of expensive heavy duty framing to support the top of the lever. Now it could be mounted upside down or higher up, but again, lots of framework would be needed for that. All in all, not as simple as it sounds. And the reason to do all that would be to enable longer logs to be processed. And that makes sense in the long run, less log cutting to do. So I am tempted, but all the timber I have at the moment is full of knots. So getting long lengths of clean wood out of them is a rare event anyway. But when that wood is all used up and I'm onto a different source, then I'll reconsider the challenge. Or if anyone ever ordered lots of shingles from me, then I'd need to alter my machine to do that job. Number four, bracing the stop end. I showed the flex in the stop end because I thought you'd be interested to see the little challenges that crop up all the time. But I'm surprised how many people thought I wouldn't just fix it. Remember, this whole machine is a work in progress. If it doesn't work, I'll change it until it does. Anyway, I did fix that stop end. There's now a plate underneath and on top 
and it's very strong and rigid. Why slice the wood in the first place is an ongoing question, comes up all the time. It's just to make thin pieces that dry quickly and cook up into charcoal quickly. And of course, what am I going to do with the charcoal? Well, there are many things that charcoal is useful for, but for a start, I hope to set it soon by the sackful as a soil additive. That's why I'm grinding it up and inoculating it with microbes. Once it's dug into the soil, it improves the structure and because it retains water and air in tiny fissures, microbial life can flourish and help plants grow. It spreads out from the charcoal and helps plants grow. And it doesn't rot away or anything, so it'll still be doing its job in a thousand years, at least. Anyway, I hope we're all caught up now. Thanks for all the comments. Seriously, I'm flattered that you take the time and trouble to think about what I'm doing. And often people tell me things that turn out to be really helpful. Now, if I just had a euro for every one of those that came in this week, then I'd be able to pay the mortgage this month. Oh well. <laughs> Stand by for a video featuring the railway next.